Welcome everyone, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I would like to welcome you to the webinar Searching for Flexibility, Why Parties to the 1970 Act of UPO Convention have not acceded to the 1991 Act. We are pleased to, that the topic has met with such great interest. My name is Ellen Cecilia Rane. I'm the head of program at the Development Fund Norway, and I'm also a board member of APREBES, uh, and I will lead you through this webinar. Uh, we will start um, with the presentation of the author, Karin Pescad, of the study, Searching for Flexibility, Why Parties to the 1978 Act of the UPO Convention have not acceded to the 1991 Act. Um, immediately afterwards, we will hear short comments from Carlos Correa, Bel Bata Thurheim, Uchenna Ugui, and Francois Mayenberg. The last 20 minutes will then be devoted to questions and comments from the audience. We intend to end the webinar at uh, 6 hours and 20 minutes Central, Central European time, uh, which means after one hour and 20 minutes. And I will also just try to make a short wrap up of the session before we close. So now I'm very pleased to announce Karin uh, Pescat. Um, she's, uh, she holds a PhD. She's an, she is an anthropologist and research associate at the Albert Hitchman Center on Democracy, Graduate Institute of International De uh, and Development Studies, Geneva. She has over 15 years of experience researching agrobiodiversity, farmers' rights, and intellectual property in agriculture. Karin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eli. Let me uh, share my screen here. So good morning, afternoon or evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Atrebes for organizing this seminar. And I will also like to thank all of those who contributed to the study. And I really hope that some of you are here today to take part in the discussion afterwards. Okay, so first uh, let me give some background to the study. So the study is about um, plant variety protection, which is a form of intellectual property rights for plant breeders. And it's also about the intergovernmental organization that promotes these rights since the 1960s. The organization is called UPOV, and UPOV is the French acronym for the International Union for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants. Now, in recent decades, the introduction of stronger plant breeders' rights legislation has proven highly contentious in many countries around the world. And this study examines these controversies, but from a very specific angle. So the research question that the study looks at or seeks to answer is the following. Why have many countries that are party to the 1978 Act of the UPOV Convention not acceded to the 1991 Act? Now, um, let me first, um, and, and just this is especially true in the Global South, where only three countries have moved from UPOV 78 to UPOV 91. Now, first, let me give some background information. And I, I realize that most of you are probably familiar with this, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So um, first, there are two versions of the UPOV Convention, the 1978 Act and the 1991 Act. Second, countries that were party to UPOV before 1999 can remain party to the 1978 Act. And I want to emphasize this because there's a common misconception that countries must necessarily move eventually to the 1991 Act, but this is not the case. There's no legal obligation to do so. However, countries that join UPOV after 1999 must necessarily join under the 1991 Act. So these countries no longer have the option of acceding under the 78 Act. And finally, the reason this matter is that there are significant differences between the two versions of the convention. So the 1991 Act reinforces plant breeders' rights and makes them more similar to uh, the rights of a patent holder. 
I cannot explain in detail here um, the differences between the two versions of the convention, but I listed on this slide the six provisions um, that I discussed in the study. And the reason I chose to focus on these provisions is that they are the ones that have been more controversial because of their implications for farmers' rights and for peasant seed systems. In every case, you can see um, in the table that UPOV 91 expands the rights of plant breeders in comparison to the earlier version. So for example, by extending the duration of protection from 15 years under the 78 Act to 20 years under the 1991 Act, or by extending plant breeders' rights, exclusive rights from seeds under the 78 Act to harvested materials under the 1991 Act, and so on. Importantly, the so-called farmer's exception, which under UPOV 78 allows farmers to use, save and exchange seeds from protected varieties is restricted in a number of ways under UPOV 91, including by becoming optional and also by being restricted to a farmer's own use. So in other words, giving away or exchanging seeds is no longer allowed under UPOV 91. Here you have a map of UPOV membership today. Um, you can see in red countries that are party to the 1991 Act of the UPOV Convention, and you can um, see that they're mostly located in the global north. In green, you can see the countries that are party to the 1978 Act of the UPOV Convention. There are 17 countries. Um, and out of these 17, we selected nine uh, for the purpose of the study. Um, you can see that the majority of UPOV Senate member countries are located in, in Latin America. And finally, in light gray, you can see the countries that are not members of UPOV. And you can see that they're mostly located in Africa, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. So the study covers nine countries that are party to UPOV 78. They are Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Ecuador in Latin America. And then outside of Latin America, we have China, New Zealand, Norway, and South Africa. So one country from each uh, region of the world. Now, in the time I have today, I'm not able to go into the details of the, of the case studies. For that, you'll have to read the study. Um, what I'll do is I'll briefly outline some key facts about each of the countries, and then I'll present the study's main conclusions. So let's start with Argentina. In Argentina, plant breeders' rights are regulated by a seed law that was adopted in 1973, so that's almost 50 years ago. There have been repeated attempts at amending the seed law um, along the lines of UPOV 91, especially in the past two decades, but these attempts have failed so far. And the main reason they've failed is that a broad coalition of farmers' unions, including large farmers, indigenous movements, and NGOs have defended the right to save seeds for replanting for all farmers. The case of Brazil is somewhat similar to Argentina. Plant breeders' rights are regulated by a PVP law, a plant variety protection law that was passed in 1997, and that is essentially based on UPOV 78. There have also been repeated attempts over the years to amend the PVP Act, but none of these bills have made it through Congress so far. And the main reason is that there is significant opposition, including among large farmers, to restricting the right to save seeds, as well as to um, increasing sanctions for PVR infringement. Now, moving to Chile, Chile is a very interesting case uh, because it has not ratified UPOV 91 for over a decade, in spite of having committed to doing so under no less than four different trade agreements. These are bilateral agreements with the US, Japan, Australia, as well as under the multilateral CPTPP um, regional trade agreements. And uh, this situation is quite unusual. And the explanation is that for Chile to ratify UPOV 91, it must first amend its domestic legislation. And opposition from peasant and indigenous organization has been strong enough to prevent the amendment of the 1994 Plant Breeders' Rights Act um, until now. 
Colombia is probably one of the most well-known cases of opposition to UPOV 91. In uh, 2010, the Colombian government passed resolution 970 to fulfill its obligation to ratify UPOV 91 under the US-Colombia Free Trade Agreement. Now, this decree went beyond UPOV 91 and would have introduced draconian conditions for seed production, storage, and, and certification. This prompted massive grassroots mobilization and a national agrarian strike. And the government um, eventually suspended resolution 970. The UPOV 91 ratification bill has since been successfully challenged uh, before the Constitutional Court by civil society organizations. But it's important to note that a number of UPOV 91 provisions remain in Colombia's domestic legislation. Ecuador is also quite unique. Contrary to the other countries that are discussed here, um, there have been no attempts at um, joining UPOV 91. On the contrary, Ecuador has passed new legislation in the past decade aimed at achieving a better balance between the rights of farmers and those of plant breeders. This is in the broader context of the adoption of a new constitution in 2008, the adoption of a law on food sovereignty, one of the first worldwide and also the adoption of new legislation on seeds and agrobiodiversity with the active participation of peasants and indigenous organizations. So since uh, 2016, land breeders' rights are legislated under a new IP law. Now, the results of this whole process are mixed. On the one hand, the seed law and this new IP law include unique provisions regarding farmers' rights to use, save, exchange, and sell seeds. On the other hand, um, civil society organization continue to contest several provisions of the new seed law and its regulations before the constitutional court. So in the case of Ecuador, a lot still hangs on the results of these court challenges on how these new laws will be implemented and also on the outcome of the negotiation of a trade, bilateral trade agreement with the United States. Now, moving to Asia, China's legislation is um, in line with UPOV 78. And it's interesting to note that China, as a party to UPOV 78, already has by far the most application for plant breeders' rights um, worldwide. Now, when China started revising its seed law a few years ago, the initial draft included several UPOV 91 provisions. But farmers' organizations, some agricultural research institutions, and civil society organizations obtained the withdrawal of these provisions from the final text of the law that was adopted in 2015. China, however, is currently revising its PVP regulations, and the draft again includes several UPOV 91 provisions. In fact, if the current draft is adopted as it is, it would bring China's legislation into line with UPOV 91 in terms of scope of protection, duration of protect, protection, etc. And it would also put limits on the amount of seeds that can be saved for replanting. So it seems that the Chinese government is intent on moving towards UPOV 91 without necessarily formally joining the 1991 Act for the time being. The case of New Zealand is quite unique. Debates around plant, plant breeders' rights in New Zealand must be understood in the context of the historical Treaty of Waitangi, signed between the Maori indigenous people and the Crown. And the fact that the Maori people have spent three decades defending the relationship to indigenous flora and fauna and their traditional knowledge. So plant breeders' rights, they're known as plant variety rights in New Zealand, are regulated under the PVR Act of 1987 and based on UPOV 78. Now, the government has been wanting to revise the Plant Breeders' Rights Act since the late 1990s, but this was delayed by the need to address Maori concerns. And to complicate things further, New Zealand has been involved in the negotiation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Regional Trade Agreement. Um, the agreement was concluded in 2018 and renamed the CPTPP following the withdrawal of the US. 
Um, like many trade agreements, it includes an obligation to join UPOV91. Now, the New Zealand government acknowledges that becoming a party to UPOV91 would represent a violation of Maori rights under the Treaty of Waitangi. So the solution the government found was to negotiate a special annex to the agreement specific to New Zealand that says that New Zealand commits to adopt a PVR system that will give effect to UPOV 91 while complying with its obligation under the Treaty of Waitangi. What this meant in practice is that New Zealand would introduce a new PVR bill, and that was done last May, that is by and large in line with UPOV 91, all the while retaining the flexibility to implement additional conditions that would normally not be allowed by UPOV. So for example, breeders um, will be required to disclose if their application involves either indigenous plant species or non-indigenous plant species of special significance to Maori people. And um, a Maori plant variety committee will, all be, will also be empowered to refuse a grant that would affect the Maori relationship to indigenous flora. Um, now, the text of the bill could still undergo changes in Congress. And it also remains to be seen, of course, how it will be implemented. And the last thing I want to say about New Zealand is that as in Argentina and Brazil, there's resistance among farmers, including large ones, to restricting uh, the right to save seeds. Now, moving to Europe, Norway passed um, Planned Breeders' Rights legislation and joined UPOV in 1993. In 2005, a draft law that would have brought Norway's legislation closer to UPOV 91 was made available for public consultation. Now, this bill was opposed by the main farmers union, as well as by some members of the scientific community. And when a new government was elected later that year, one of its first decisions in office was to reject the bill to amend the PBR Act on the ground that it would undermine farmers' rights. And the government argued at the time that the amendments would have imposed too many limitations on farmers' rights to save, reuse, and exchange seeds. So at the time, the government explicitly upheld its right to remain a party um, to UPOV under the 1978 Act, which in its view offered a better balance between farmers' rights and plant breeders' rights. Now, the issue of joining UPOV 91 has not been raised since 2005, and there seems to be a wide consensus in Norway in favor of the status quo. And finally, um, our last country is South Africa. South Africa introduced plant breeders' rights very early in 1961. That's the same year UPOV was established. In 1977, South Africa became the first country in the Global South and only the 10th globally to join UPOV. South Africa was also the only country from the Global South to take part in the 1991 revision of the UPOV Convention. In spite of all of this, South Africa is today the only African member of UPOV that is a party to the 1978 Act. But this is because other African countries joined UPOV after 1999 and therefore did not have the option of joining under the 78 Act. However, this could change. In 2018, South Africa adopted a revised Planned Breeders' Rights Act. The new act is based on UPOV 91, and some of its provisions even go beyond the requirements of UPOV 91. But this act would, will only come into effect when the regulations are approved, and this is. Um, this will probably happen um, later this year. As elsewhere, farmers' rights to seeds have been the most contentious issue during the revisions of the PBR uh, legislation. But the 2018 PBR Act was drafted in a way that leaves room for the Ministry of Agriculture to make provisions in the regulations for the implementations of farmers' rights to save, use, exchange, and sell seeds. Now, as you can see from this very quick overview, there's quite a broad range of scenarios around um, plant variety protection and UPOV 91. And yet we can also identify a number of common threads. The first point I want to highlight 
and which gave its name to the study, is that each country in its own way is searching for flexibility in how it regulates the breeders' rights a flexibility that is severely restricted under the 1991 Act. As we've seen, Norway took an official stance to remain with UPOF 78 because it offers a better balance between farmers' rights and plant breeders' rights. New Zealand acknowledged that acceding to UPOF 91 would violate the Treaty of Waitangi, and in order to ratify the CPTPP agreement, New Zealand will give effect to the main provision of UPOV 91 while officially remaining a party to UPOV 78, and this in order to retain the flexibility necessary to protect Maori rights. Even China, whose government seems intent on introducing UPOV 91 norms, want to do so on its own terms without becoming externally bound by the 1991 Act. The second element that stands out is the extent to which strengthening of plant breeders' rights has been controversial everywhere. In all of the countries discussed in the study without exception, legislative reform of the plant breeders' rights legislation has prompted widespread debates, strong opposition, and in some cases, judicial action. And the results of these mobilization has been to either stop or mitigate these reforms. Farmer, peasant, and indigenous organization and NGOs have been at the forefront of this mobilization. But as the case of Argentina, Brazil, and New Zealand show, even large farmers are divided over the strengthening of plant breeders' rights, in particular over restricting farmers' rights to save seeds for replanting, and also over strengthening sanctions for PBR infringement. So controversial is UPOV 91 that several people I talked to were of the opinion that its ratification was unlikely to come through a domestic legislative process, but would only happen if it were externally imposed by a free trade agreement. The study also shows that when farmers organizations have the opportunity to engage in political processes, as was the case in Ecuador and Norway, the outcome is almost invariably the rejection of UPOV of 91. And this begs the question of whether UPOV 91 can be adopted if farmers' rights to participation, which is a right enshrined in international instruments such as the FAO Plan Treaty and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants, is fulfilled. A third common thread among the case studies is that of all the provisions of the 1991 Act, the most controversial by far are those related to farmers' rights. Now, UPOV five minutes the, left. Sorry, yes. okay. five minutes no, left. Thanks. UPOV and the plant breeding industry seek to restrict the farmers' exception as much as possible in order to ensure the largest possible market for commercial seeds. Farmers and indigenous organizations counter argue that saving, exchanging, and selling seeds represent not a privilege but a right. And they also argue that these practices are essential to maintain peasant seed systems and agrobiodiversity, and ultimately to achieve seed and food security and sovereignty. Now, except for Colombia, all countries provide for broad all news exceptions that allow farmers to save seeds from protected varieties for replanting on their own farm without any restrictions. And this sort of broad farmer's exception would be further restricted if these countries were to accede to the 1901 Act. Fourth, the study also shows that one of the main reasons why countries have not acceded to the 1991 Act is that it conflicts with other legal norms at both the domestic and the international level. In Colombia and Ecuador, this includes the constitutional rights of indigenous communities and communities of African descent, in New Zealand, this includes Maori rights under the Treaty of Waitangi. At the international level, all countries uh, discussed here, with the exception of China, have either signed or ratified the FAO Plan Treaty. Under the treaty, national governments commit to taking measures to protect and promote farmers' rights. This includes the right to save, use, exchange, and sell farm saves seeds. Now, in direct contradiction to these provisions, the 1991 19, Act further restricts farmers' rights to save seeds from protected varieties and prohibits seed exchange and sales. And finally, uh, the fifth and last point I would like to emphasize is the extent to which pressure to join UPOV 91 comes through bilateral and regional trade agreements. As you can see from this table um, that's taken from the report, 
all nine countries are engaged in at least one such agreement. In three cases, Chile, Colombia, and New Zealand, this includes a commitment to adopt the 1991 Act. But interestingly, none of the three has ratified UPA of 91 um, so far. In other cases, the obligation to, to join UPA of 91 was initially included in trade negotiations. For example, in the case of the EU-Mercosur free trade agreement that involves Argentina and Brazil, and also in the case of the RCEP involving China and New Zealand, but it was dropped in the final text because of opposition. So to conclude, the study shows that countries as diverse as Brazil, China, or New Zealand, or Norway, believe it is in their best interest to retain some flexibility in how they regulate land breeders' rights by remaining party to UPOV 78 instead of joining the 1991 Act. Now, this holds important lessons for countries that are not yet members of UPOV because these countries no longer have the option of joining under the Sydney Act. These countries, however, still have the option of developing their own so generous PVP legislation. As we've seen uh, earlier, countries that are not yet members of UPOV are mostly located in Global South, in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. In these countries, a majority of people live in rural areas and peasant sea systems play a vital role in food production and agrobiodiversity. So if countries with industrialized agricultural systems such as Norway and New Zealand consider it is in their best interest to remain party to UPOV 78, this is even more true for countries where family farming and peasant seed systems are central to rural livelihoods and food security. One last thing I want to say is that the 1991 Act um, was adopted 30 years ago this year. In the intervening three decades, the international legal framework on human rights and environmental law has greatly evolved with the adoption of the Convention on Biological Diversity in 1992, the FAO Plan Treaty in 2001, the Nagoya Protocol in 2010, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants in 2018. So the conflicts with the UPA Convention have become even more acute over the years. In this context, as this study shows and others have suggested, developing so generous PVP systems outside of the UPA framework, as permitted by the WTO TRIPS agreement, provides a better way to balance plant breeders' rights and farmers' rights and resolve these conflicts. And um, I would just like to um, end by saying that you know, there's only so much you can say in 25 minutes. Um, the study gives a much fuller picture. So if you're interested in these issues, I really encourage you to read the full study. And um, I really look forward to the comments and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Karine, for this excellent presentation and for providing such a good summary of a quite comprehensive study. Um, so I would just remind the participant to just keep <laughs> your questions for yourself for the time being. You can either write it down uh, on a piece of paper and raise your hands uh, afterwards, uh, after the comments, or you can also just post it in the Q&A uh, section. So now we will move to the comments and we have invited three experts to provide their comments to the study. And we will start by Carlos Correa. Um, Carlos is, since 1st of July in 2018, he's the executive director of the South, of the South Center, mm -hmm. uh, the intergovernmental organization of developing countries based in Geneva. Um, which helps developing uh, countries to combine their efforts and expertise to promote their common interests in the international uh, arena. Uh, Professor Correa has worked with the Argentine government and has been the director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies on Industrial Property uh, and Economics at the Law Faculty of the University of Buenos Aires. He was also a member of the UK Commission on Intellectual Property Rights, the Commission on uh, Intellectual uh, Property Rights Innovation and Public Health established by the World Health uh, Assembly and of the FAO panel of eminent experts on ethics in food and agriculture. Um, Carlos has, he is both a lawyer and, is, and an economist from the University of Buenos Aires, and he also holds a PhD in law from the University of Buenos Aires. He's the author of several books and numerous articles. Um, so Carlos, the floor is yours. You have five minutes and I will uh, let you know 
when your five minutes has gone. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Eileen, for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me to participate at, at this event. Let me start by commending uh, the author for this excellent paper, very informative, with very good information. And of course, a previous for commissioning the study and continue working in this area. Let me make uh, a couple of comments and two observations uh, to start with, and then three comments. The first observation is that uh, I really fully agree with the premise on which this study is based, the need for uh, countries, whether developed or developing, to keep flexibility in order to uh, put in place a seed system which is suitable to their own reality. So I think this, this premise is very important, the flexibility that is the premise of the study needs to be kept. And uh, let's hope that the countries that still uh, are in the context of 1978 will keep this option uh, as the valid and unique option. The second observation is that I appreciate very much the references that have been made in the study and now in the presentation to the International uh, Plant Treaty, the FAO uh, Treaty on Plant Genetic Social Food and Agriculture, which as we know, recognizes species tree farming rights. And also uh, to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in the Rural Areas. This is an important achievement, adopted as one mentioned in, in 2018. It will be very important to work, and the South Center is looking for partners, in, in fact, to do this, to work for the implementation, the real implementation of this declaration, in particular, the right to seeds, which is explicitly contained in one of the provisions of the uh, UN declaration. So now, three brief comments. The first one is that, in fact, there is quite a large body of uh, academic literature which supports the point made in this study the need to keep flexibility, the fact that uh, allowing farmers to save, to exchange, uh, to sell their seed is crucial for agricultural development and food security. And, and there, are, there are also a large number of reports that have been published on this subject, including almost 20 years ago, the, the report of the UK Commission on Intellectual Property that was, that was mentioned. Uh, the reports by the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food, uh, they, they also emphasize very much the, the so-called farmers' privilege. And interestingly, there was a report produced by UPOV, the UPOV Secretariat, uh, in 2005, the title of which is UPOV Report on the Impact of Plant Variety Protection. And in this report, there is analysis of, uh, in particular, of two countries that uh, were subject, continue to be subject to Europe of 1978, Argentina and China. And, and let, me, uh, let me indicate some of the conclusions of this study in, in relation to Argentina, for instance, under Europe of 1978, it, is, uh, it was found by UPOV that uh, the, the application of, of the treaty had improved performance of new varieties. There has been an increase in the number of domestic breeding entities and there has been an increase in horizontal cooperation in the seed industry. In relation to China, among uh, many positive impact of UPOV 1978, the UPOV Secretariat noted rapid uptake by farmers of new varieties and the stimulation of commercial breeding activities in China. So interestingly, UPOV itself, UPOV Secretariat has recognized that uh, UPOV 78 had important positive impact. So uh, limiting accession to UPOV 78, in my view, has been a, a policy mistake done uh, by UPOV. These uh, conventions should still be open for accession. Um, but as we know, um, this, is, this has been closed. And there is, however, the need to comply with uh, Article 27.3b of the TRIPS agreement. And therefore, countries that have not joined UPOV or they look for the system for plant protect protection varieties, they should look into possibilities to develop a sweet generous regime. Uh, there are a number of countries such as uh, India, Malaysia, China have developed a sweet generous regime, which is not uh, following the UPOV standards. And this is important to, uh, to continue working on this. And in fact, a previous with other organization published a, a paper to which uh, Francois made important contributions in 2015 which develops some elements. Uh, it is a real, it, in fact, a tool uh, for countries that want to develop a generic regime for plant variety protection, which also includes the recognition, the full recognition of farmer rights. 
Then my, my third and last comment, one of the points made, made by the author, which is quite important, is the fact that many free trade agreements have actually imposed on partner countries the obligation to join of uh, 91. And it's really noticeable the case of Chile in particular uh, that has uh, avoided this situation for so many years after signing the agreement of the United States. Also the case of Colombia and Ecuador. And as, as the author has also mentioned, it is noticeable that in the recent negotiation between the Mercosur countries, which include not only Brazil, Argentina, but also Uruguay and, and Paraguay, there has been agreement by the European Union not to force a Mercosur country to join in COVID-91, which is quite what the success in the contract negotiation. But this is an important lesson for countries now negotiating free trade agreements. So there is a possibility to exclude this uh, obligation to join in COVID-1991, which as was mentioned, restricts very much the capacity of the countries to implement policies which are suitable to their uh, own system. So thank you very much again. A congratulations to Apreves and the author. And then I, I encourage you to continue working in these areas and other challenges that uh, our countries are facing, including the proliferation of patents uh, because of the of the gene editing and, and other new technologies. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Carlos. So our next commenter is Bel Batatore. She's a senior advisor of the Ministry of Agriculture and Food in Norway. Uh, and she has more than actually 20 years of experience from plant variety protection, uh, from working uh, with plant variety protection and farmers' rights. Uh, she is Norway's focal point of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. And she's also part of Norway's delegation to UPOV. Bell, the floor is yours and you have five minutes. Thank you very much uh, and thanks a lot for this in invitation to this seminar. Congratulations to Afrebis with their report. Um, and uh, I would, my, in my, my comment uh, on the need, need for flexibility, I would like to share one proposal by, by Norway uh, at the recent UN Food, seed, uh, food Summit, <laughs> uh, where we raised the issue of seed security and um, indicating our the Norwegian approach and priorities in this field. Uh, so uh, in the follow-up to, to the Food Summit, Norway proposed um, a so-called game-changer proposal on um, stressing the need for participatory approaches to seed development. Um, next slide, please. And uh, the reason for this it is based uh, on the need to recognize the diversity of seed systems and therefore also you need flexibility in the approaches, policies and legal systems that are put in, in place. Uh, so uh, to the left here in uh, orange, uh, it's a kind of description of a, the linear uh, system, uh, the so-called form, formal seed system, which is quite dominated in the global north which provide most of the seeds farmer use. In such a linear seed system, farmers usually then buy certified seeds of registered varieties developed in scientific breeding programs. And this seed system model receives now most support by governments and large development actors around the world. However, in most developing countries, farmer seed systems in blue to the right there uh, supply the bulk of the seeds used by smallholder farmers. And for money crops, farmer seed systems is the only system that exists. For others, more commercially interesting crops like maize, the formal system and farmer systems coexist and seeds often move from the formal to farmer seed systems. Next slide, please. Farmer seed systems in, um, not so fast, please go back to one. Uh, so farmer seed systems in many countries supply uh, up to like 89% of the seeds and they are especially important for women and the poor. And this empirical fact forms the basic premise for, for, for the Norwegian proposal um, to, to put farmer first in, in seed policies. Uh, farm, because farmer seed systems are fundamental for food and nutritional security. 
and they uh, therefore need far more attention and support. But we would also like to stress that no, no size fits all and, and there should be f flexible approaches also in supporting pharmacy systems. So in the shaded blue uh, circles, um, there are some, some examples uh, of uh, common uh, approaches to support activities and functioning in the seed systems that farmers use. And this list spans from activities such as cooperative plant breeding, cooperative seed production to establishment of enabling laws and policies. Next slide, please. So the goal uh, is then, of course, to have seed security uh, and farm and FAO defines seed security to exist when men and women within the household have sufficient access to quantities of available good quality seed and planting materials of preferred crop varieties at all times in both good and bad cropping seasons. And in order to kind of achieve uh, the best approaches in different conditions, it's important to strengthen uh, the agency of farmers. That means empowering farmers in seed system development and, and to strengthen the capacity of, of farmers and groups of farmers to make their own decisions about what seed they use, how that seed is produced and distributed, and their ability to engage in processes that shape seed system policies and governance. Um, so we, we believe that um, it should be far more attention uh, to uh, the different needs and priorities of farmers and local communities around the world in when developing policies, legal system, defining financial support and technical support uh, to reflect uh, the diverse conditions. And in order to do this, you need a flexible uh, approach, meaning also flexibility in, in terms of uh, which PVP system that would be most appropriate in different contexts. So thank you very, very much uh, for the attention. So I look forward to questions, discussions further on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Belle. So then I will move to uh, our next presenter, which is Uchenna Ugui. Um, she's a lawyer and has a PhD from the University of At uh, Ottawa Faculty of Law. She also holds a master's degree in public international law with distinction uh, from the University of Leicester, United Kingdom. Her research analyzes um, the provisions for patents and plant variety protection in mul multilateral and regional agreements to explore the implications for food security in West Africa. Uchenna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I want to start off by commending the author. Indeed, the analysis here is at a time when uh, many countries are in the process of implementing the CPTPP agreement. The African countries are currently negotiating IP and plant variety protection under the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And the EU economic partnership agreements with certain countries are being implemented. This study gives necessary direction on the issue of it lays an emphatic voice saying, look, there needs to be more flexibility rather than conformity in order to adopt plant variety protection to advance development. I start with this slide because um, it gives like a picture saying, hey, on the one side, we have the farmer's rights. <laughs> you have the sustainable development goals. You have your unique characteristics socioeconomic circumstances as a country. And then we have the UPOV 91, as this study has highlighted, more is not always the better. It's not just simply adopting higher standards of plant variety protection or plant breeders' rights will not necessarily lead to economic empowerment of the people or development on the ground. And then you have the advancements that need to be made. So this leads us to a question. The question would be, for many countries would be, does this flexibility not contradict the principle of non-discrimination in international laws? And also how can this be practically implemented on the ground? Uh, 
we will see that at the end, I will show you a different slide that shows a happier picture than the first one that we started with. And that's the area I want to focus on a little bit. Yes, this, the study has highlighted the fact that there are problems, but if you as a country are saying, okay, I'm already into these agreements. Is there anything I can do? Am I locked in? And others will say, okay, maybe I don't have the political power or the clout to make a difference. What else can be done? I'm glad to say that based on this study and further studies I've conducted myself, there are actually ways out by which you can apply plant variety protection and plant breeders' rights without compromising your public interest and national development goals as a nation. The two key instruments are the principles of differentiation and instrumentalism. The differentiation principle simply says that you can't apply the same laws to two countries that are of different status. By that, for example, you have a developed country, developing country, least developing countries. These have different status quos. Some countries, their challenges have been environmental, some social, some economic. You need to tailor the cloth to suit the size of the particular country. An instrumentalist approach says that laws are not just provided to, uh, and intellectual properties are not just provided as an end and goal in themselves, but they're provided to achieve certain goals. They're provided to advance the socioeconomic development of certain countries. How this comes about, strategy is very key here, and that's what we'll look into in the following slide. Um, First of all, there are provisions for flexibilities already existing in multilateral IP agreements. There are provisions for parallel importation of goods, of seeds. There are exceptions that uh, are available. You can put in exceptions and limitations to the current rights under different agreements. Uh, I've listed some of them here. You can have compulsory licensing and you can allow for public non-commercial use of certain seeds and agreements. These provisions are there, they're available, but they're not being fully utilized by countries because they're not always aware of them. Utilizing these provisions requires action on the parts of governments, whereby they put in place policies that allow them the power to make use of these agreements. Um, going a bit further, uh, I want to emphasize that there's the opportunity for access and benefit sharing, prior informed consent, and traditional knowledge and farmers' rights. In this particular area, I think it's important with regard to, um, to emphasize that the essentially de derived varieties that are recognized under the UPOV 1991 Act doesn't protect these genetic resources. And it's important in, for countries like in Africa, in uh, Latin America, where the peasants seeds are still very important in the agricultural process to continue to protect these by a sui generis and alternative system. An alternative system has been analyzed. In my own part, I've looked at preparing an alternative framework for countries in the economic community of West African states in implementing their agreement with the European Union and also with other countries. So we have, what I'm trying to emphasize is that there doesn't have to be a conflict these rights and interests can be brought together. If you look at the third line where I talk of differentiation and balancing of rights, strategies can be adopted by different countries whereby your laws will be analyzed, holistic interpretation will be made, IP doesn't exist in a box, can be interpreted with constitutional rights, socioeconomic rights, the CBD, the ITPGGRFA, and other different agreements. Terms need to be redefined and it's important to calculate not just the end and say, okay, these laws have been in conformity, but how can we bring these laws to bring about? So in, an interdisciplinary approach is very important. If countries are able to it's do that, we'll have this happy ending in, whereby public plant breeders' rights will support the interests of different countries. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Uchana for also ending on a positive note to show that it is possible actually to uh, end up with good systems. So now we're moving to our last commenter, which will be Francois Meyenberg. 
Uh, he has worked from 1999 to 2017 as the campaign coordinator for the Bern Declaration or recently renamed Public Eye in Switzerland, with a focus on intellectual property rights, ABS and agriculture. During this time, he was also the co-founder of APREBES, uh, which was founded back in 2009. And since 2018, he has been engaged as a coordinator of APREBES. So please, Francois, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Aline. <clears throat> and I also like to thank uh, Karine for her presentation and her great work. And I was very happy that we were able to engage Karine to do this study. I'd just like to share some thoughts from my thoughts, uh, from my side, thoughts uh, I had when I when I read the study written by Karin. First, when the possibility to join UP of 78 was closed back in 99, there were still 35 countries member to UP of 78, with 16, country, 16 countries coming from the global south. Since then, in the last 22 years, most European countries, as well as the US and Canada, joined UP of 91, but only three out of 16 developing countries, and as we know, in case of Peru and Panama, this was done under pressure from a free trade agreement, switched to UPOF 91. So the fact that the big majority of developing countries have chosen to stay with UPOF 78 for over 20 years now is, in my view, a proof, a proof that this, is more flex that this more flexible system better fits to their needs and circumstances. And thanks to the study by Kareen, we know now better why they need this flexibility. But as we know, the pressure on countries not being member of UPOF so far, the pressure to join is still omnipresent, especially by free trade agreements. But can this demand still be justified under the facts described? For example, how can you explain to Mongolia that its neighboring country, China, is very successful in formal plant breeding, but that Mongolia is recommended to have a much stricter plant variety protection law? Or how can you explain to African countries that the big agricultural exporters of Latin America as Brazil and Argentina protect the rights of farmers in a way that African countries should not be allowed to do? Why do African countries need stricter laws than Latin American countries? Or how do you explain to small states in the Pacific that they are not allowed to protect the rights of indigenous peoples in the same way as New Zealand is doing under the Plant Right Protection Act. This makes no sense. Switzerland is also a particular example of incoherence. As you may know, within the framework of the European Free Trade Association and its free trade agreements, Switzerland is demanding accession to UPOF 91. However, Switzerland itself has introduced a wording in its national plant variety protection law concerning the farmer's privilege, which is not compatible with UPOF 91. We got evidence on this because Liechtenstein, which normally takes over Swiss IP law, for example, in patent law, is not able to become now a member of UPOF with the Swiss law. This case shows that even members of UPOF 91 want more flexibility than allowed on the UPOF 91. Switzerland was able to ratify the 91 Act as their law was not checked by the UPOF Council, as it is the case for all new members, uh, as it is the case for all members switching from 78 to 91. But it's different for new members because their law will be checked. What particularly struck me in Karen's study was the statement that in countries of the South, where there is a real public discussion, and she also mentioned Norway, a real public discussion with the participation of farmers' organization, UPOF 91 will hardly find 
find acceptance. But there are many examples of this. But this means that the introduction of UPOF 91 only succeeds if the international obligations on the, for example, the international treaty, such, such as the farmer's right to participate in decision making, is not respected. Again, free trade agreements are a good example. In negotiations on these agreements, there is never any active participation of farmers' organizations. Yet the decisions that determine legislation on plant variety rights are taken here in the free trade agreements negotiations. But the right to participate is always ignored. It should go without saying that the right to participate should also be upheld by other international organizations, such as the FAO or WIPO. If they are here to advise other countries, they should therefore also inform ab about correct processes in line with farmers' rights under the treaty and at about various, the various possibilities to protect breeders and farmers' rights in a balanced way. However, especially in the case of WIPO, we see that this is not the case, but that they refer to UPOF and thus fulfill the role as advisors in a very one-sided way that is not always to the advantage of the advised countries. Thanks a lot.